21, Adam. I finally lift myself off the ground only to find Jason smirking at me. He rolls his eyes and leans against the wall with his arms crossed. He walks over, offers me his hand, and helps me to my feet. Everything okay upstairs, he asks, pointing a finger at the ceiling. Things are great, I tell him. And they are. Better than I could have hoped for in such a short time. The bumpiest day was the first day we were stuck together, but Millie suggested quickly. We formed a routine. I cook our meals, and she's busied herself making the apartment fit for human life. I'm still learning her habits. Like how she makes the bed in the morning. I've never cared about that. I don't know if she's aware, but the food on her plate never touches. She keeps everything spaced apart. Her favorite flavor of ice cream is strawberry, and she takes off her shoes and socks the minute she steps inside. She changes her nail polish every couple of days, and her fingers and toes always match. Her favorite television shows are legal dramas, and she's a cheapskate who keeps track of every penny she spends. That was the most surprising thing about my bride. That and her attempts to make me fiscally responsible. It's always a struggle to keep a serious face whenever she updates one of her spreadsheets. She also has three different savings accounts, including an emergency and secret account, which isn't so secret since she mentions it whenever she feels the need to lecture me about my spending. Let's eat, Alex says. Jason, stop frowning at Adam. The dining room table is set, and I admit the food does smell good. My stomach growls loudly. I haven't eaten since lunch, and I worked out this morning and after school. There's roasted chicken, rice, and several green vegetables. I made sweet potatoes too, Mrs. Dupree says. She runs to the kitchen and returns with a platter of baked sweet potatoes. Jason and Alex sit while I help Addie into her high chair. I finish in enough time to pull Mel's chair out for her. When we sit, her hand lands on my lap. It's as if she's holding on to me for comfort. Everyone is quiet while we serve ourselves. Alex has a fake smile plastered on her face. Jason frowns at me, and Addie shoves fistfuls of food in her mouth. Mel pushes her food around her plate, so I lean in and kiss her temple. She smiles, relaxes, and starts to eat. When I look up, Jason is still scowling at me, but Alex's plastic smile is replaced with a genuine one. So, Melanie, her mother begins, how's work treating you? Is everything going well with the promotion? Mel's fork stops halfway to her mouth. She looks around the room as if to confirm her mother is speaking to her. It's going well, thanks. It's as if she's speaking to a stranger, and that saddens me. When I became the vice principal at my school, my mother not only bragged about me to all her friends and siblings, but she spent the entire night before the first day of school baking brownies and cookies for all the teachers. Mrs. Dupree looks a little deflated by the dismissive answer, but she puts a smile on her face and continues. And how did you two become a couple? You guys weren't together when I visited six months ago, and now you're married. What's your point, mother? Millie asks. I can sense the tension in Jason's body. He's so rigid he could snap. My point is my daughter got married and I didn't know she was dating anyone. That's my point, Melanie. She lays her fork down on her plate and looks at Melanie, demanding an answer. When was the last time I called you and volunteered anything about my life? Why would this be any different? Jason's fork hits his plate and he puts his head in his hands. Well, you know, Diane, Alex says. It was just one of those things. Everyone saw the chemistry between Melly and Adam since day one. They were always inevitable. Have you told your father? Mrs. Dupree ignores Alex. He's on a cruise ship with his girlfriend. I'll tell him when he comes home in a few days. The room goes deathly quiet at the mention of the girlfriend. And Adam. She puts those calculating eyes back on me. 
Have you told your parents about this unexpected? She waves her hand around until she finds the right word, union. We told my mother yesterday, and she's thrilled. She loves Mel. Oh, yes. She's been texting Melly all day, Alex says with a high-pitched laugh. Show everyone that naked baby picture of Adam she texted you, Melly. Please don't, Jason says. Oh. If I didn't know any better, I think Mrs. Dupree was hurt at the prospect of Mel and my mother getting close. It would have been nice if I was given the same courtesy as Adam's mother, but here we are. Mom, Jason says, they eloped. I'm sure Flynn's mother was as surprised as you were. Yeah, same, but with the tiny exception of being happy for us, Melly throws out. You know what it's like to be happy for your child, right, mother? Oh, wait. That rule only applies to one of your children. I squeeze Mel's thigh, but she's so tense her shoulders are practically to her ears. That's not true. Her mother's words are whispered, but I hear the tortured pain. That's never been true. Melanie stands, and I stand too. I heard it with my own ears, so you don't get to walk that back. Let's just leave, Mel, I say to her. I'd love to hear more, but not in front of Addie. No one is leaving, Jason says, standing up abruptly. Flynn, you want to be a part of this family. Sit down. Melly, come on. Please, stay. Not if she's going to continue to upset my wife, I say to Jason. I'm only trying to have a conversation. I'm not trying to upset you, Melanie. I'm not trying to upset anyone. Mrs. Dupree shakes her head. She looks up and her eyes have pooled with tears. I just want to talk. Talk, Auntie, Addison says. Mel looks at me, nods, and we sit back down. The only person still eating now is Addie, who's chewing on a drumstick. Melly, are you going into the office tomorrow? Alex asks. I'm officially working remote until the baby comes. Mel exhales loudly through her nose and nods at Alex. She picks up her fork, and I do the same. I'm going in for the first half of the day. I'm interviewing two people tomorrow, but we have a furniture delivery, so I'll be home for that. Warmth spreads through me when she refers to the apartment upstairs as home. Most of the furniture is gone. Mel even had the place painted a few days ago. Oh, that sounds exciting, her mother says with false enthusiasm. And you'll be choosing who to hire? I am the hiring manager, Mel says. And what about you, Adam? You're a teacher, right? I worked in the public schools back in New Jersey. I was a librarian. I'm a vice principal, Mrs. Dupree, but I taught math before that. Tell me about your parents. It's always been just me and my ma, I tell her. She's wonderful, but a little nutty. Right, Mel? Not to me. I kind of love her, Mel says, and I can't help the feeling in my chest about my wife loving my mother. And she was okay with this, she asks, gesturing to me and Mel. He's already answered that, Mel says. Right, but I meant the entire, she pretends to search for the word. She looks to Jason for help, but he shakes his head at her. The interracial aspect. Your mother is fine with that? Why wouldn't she be? I put my hand on Mel's shoulder and gently massage the stress away. It's just that some people object to that kind of thing, right? The only thing my mother cares about is that I'm happy. What kind of mother would object to their child finding love and getting married? I stare right into her eyes, daring her to say anything else. And what happened to your father? Diane asks, quickly changing the subject about my mother. The entire table goes silent while they wait for my response. He's dead, is all I say. I didn't know that, Mel says. I thought you guys were only estranged. She rubs my thigh underneath the table, puts her chin on my shoulder, and whispers, I'm sorry. You didn't know your husband's father is dead? 
The accusatory tone in Diane's voice isn't lost on anyone. She tosses her fork on her plate as if she's disgusted. So, Adam, Alex says quickly, I have a favor to ask you. Will you help get me back in shape after the baby is born? Just knock on my door when you're ready to get started. I'll design a workout routine for you, I tell her. She smiles at me, and Jason mouths thank you. I'm not sure if it's because I've agreed to help his wife or if it's because I ignored his mother's last bitchy comment. You'll look gorgeous in your bridesmaid dress, Mel says, after taking a deep breath. You could hear a pin drop after that statement. Jason looks at me and arches his eyebrow. Oh? Who is getting married? A friend from work, her mother asks. No, mother. I am. Well, we're already married, but we are having a small wedding in August. Jason, I want you to be my best person. Even though I rocked that tuxedo when I was best person at your wedding, I won't make you wear a dress for mine. That would be fun to see, I snicker. You can borrow one of mine, Alex says, laughing loudly. Jason opens his mouth to speak, but his mother talks first. You're having an actual wedding? She drops her fork again, and it clangs loudly against her plate. This farce has gone far enough, don't you think, Melanie? Nobody here buys this marriage of convenience. So convenient that you only announced it when I come to town. You're acting out like a child. Didn't I pay enough attention to you when you were growing up? Why do you have to do this? Mom, enough, Jason warns. My marriage is not about you, mother. Melanie throws her napkin on her plate. Addie must think it's a game because she tosses hers on the floor. Yes, I believe it is. Her mother jets out her chin at her statement. For the record, you paid plenty of attention to me as a child, all of which was negative. Do you think I enjoyed being belittled or made to feel like an afterthought or unwanted? I never. You did. But whatever. I spent years being angry and hurtful towards Jason because of the way you treated us. You treated him like a prince, but I was the stupid, red-headed stepchild. Always. That's your perception of me, so fine. I know who I am, and I don't live my life for your approval. I left New Jersey to get away from you, yet here you are. Millie yells while gesturing towards her mother with both hands. Yes, I married Adam. Is it so crazy that a man would want to marry me? And yes, we're having a wedding. That is all you need to know. Your presence is not required. She leaves the table, and I get up and follow, but not before giving her mother a scathing look. You guys, please don't leave, Alex says, but Melly is already yanking the door open. I run behind her as she takes the steps two at a time. She opens the door and throws her purse on the floor. There's no couch anymore, so she runs to the bedroom, and I follow behind her. She starts to pace, and when she turns to face me, I stand in front of her and open my arms. She walks right in, and I tighten my arms around her. She puts her face in my chest and lets out a muffled scream. I rub her back and tell her everything is going to be okay. I'm sorry you had to go through that, I tell her. Has it always been like that between the two of you? Since I was about 13. We were never very close. She's always preferred Jason, but things really went bad between us when I didn't score high enough to get into the same high school as him. It was really competitive, and You don't ever have to explain that, Mel. It's okay, I say, finally understanding the reason for the rift between my wife and her mother. Millie committed the horrible sin of not being as academically gifted as her brother, and her mother has never forgiven her for it. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. We wouldn't have gotten as far into the meal as we did if you hadn't been there. She was on her best behavior. I'm over it, Adam. Why did she have to come here? To the one place I ran to get away from her. And why does she have to tear down everything that I do? Yeah, our relationship is unconventional, 
but she doesn't know that. She just has to dig and dig until she finds something to beat me over the head with. The thing is, if Jason had flown to Vegas and gotten married, there would be no third degree, but I can't so much as sneeze without her accusing me of doing it on purpose to get attention. As if I would ever want any kind of attention from her. Her of all people. Are you fucking kidding me? She pushes out of my arms and walks out of the bedroom. She paces around the empty apartment before she walks to the kitchen and kicks the cabinet underneath the sink. I grab her hand and bring her to the table, where I place her on my lap with my arm wrapped tightly around her. Hurting your foot won't help anything. Nothing will, she says. I can feel the strain in her voice. The anger's gone now, but the sadness and resignation are much, much worse. I need a shower. She tries to jump off my lap, but my arm is wrapped too tight around her. There's a loud knock on the door, and it bursts open before either one of us can say come in. 22. Melly. Jason walks into the house, his eyes darting back and forth until he finds us sitting in the kitchen. He stands there, hands on his hips. I hold my breath and wait for him to take our mother's side, just like he used to before we mended our relationship. Looking back, I don't blame him for that. I was as hostile to him as I was to her. Flynn, I need to talk to my sister. I don't miss his dismissive tone, and that irritates me. He stays, I tell him. Adam kisses my shoulder and I relax against him. If this is what I think it is, I'll need someone on my side for a change. I'm sorry for that ambush. We had words. She wanted to come up here, but I told her to back off. I'm sorry for the whole situation, Melly. I had no idea she was on the verge of losing the house, or I would have helped. I didn't know she was coming here until she showed up. And I feel like I've failed you because you had to leave your home. He grabs a chair and sits. His broad shoulders look smaller today. I reach over and touch his hand. I don't blame you for any of this. I don't. It's not his fault our mother puts him on a pedestal and treats me like a second-class citizen. It's taken me years to come to that realization, and I don't want to go back. Don't even put that in your head. She needs you, and you're a good son. He seems relieved by my words and lets out a breath as he runs a hand over his head. Don't worry. She'll only be here a few months at the most, then her apartment will be ready. Jake says his dad's personal assistant is retiring in April, and if mom's a good fit, she can have the job. In the meantime, she's going to watch Addison. I nod at him and tell myself that I can deal with this situation for another three or four months. Sounds good, Jace, I say, hoping to put his mind at ease. Adam's arms tighten around me, and I lay my head on his shoulder. The tension from earlier starts to dissipate. I'm not sure if it's because of the talk I just had with Jason or if it's because of Adam's comforting embrace. Then he kisses my temple, and everything is right. Jason watches, and I bristle while I wait for him to say something to Adam, but he doesn't. He stands and looks around the place. What the hell happened to Flynn's ugly couch? It wasn't that bad, Adam says. Yes, it was, Jason and I say at once. And you painted, he notices while he admires the freshly painted beige walls. This place is getting a complete makeover, I tell him. We'll have you, Alex, and Addie over for dinner this weekend. We'll have your mom and uncle too, Adam. He squeezes me tighter and kisses my temple again. And Ananda and Dennis. We'll have a little party. I jump from Adam's lap, run to the bedroom and return with my laptop. I don't have time to kick myself for thinking of throwing a party after all the money I spent on new furniture, but the idea of sharing our home with our friends excites me. Are we doing another spreadsheet? Adam asks. He pats his lap and I sit back down, 
excited about the weekend. I'm the one who did Jason's housewarming party for him, and I tricked Alex into coming. Remember that, Jace. Jason offers me a fist bump and I hit it with mine. I'll leave you guys alone. Let me know if you need help when the new furniture gets here. He says goodbye and walks out. We sit there in silence until Adam bites the top of my ear, and I let out a surprised yelp. Give it to me, Mel, his husky voice whispers in my ear. It goes right through my belly and straight down to my pussy. It throbs and when he bites my ear again, I let out a moan this time. You want it, huh? I'm not usually one for flirting. I say what I mean and get to the point, but when you're sitting on the lap of a sexy beast who can't get enough of you, it's hard not to. Yeah, spread it. Give me that spreadsheet. He laughs in my ear, and I laugh along with him. I try to punch his chest, but he moves out of the way and ducks. My superior boxing moves. I jump off his lap and attempt to punch him again, but he stands up and starts to shuffle. I mirror his movements and lean in for a jab. He moves a fraction, and I miss. A piece of his hair falls across his forehead, and it's about the sexiest thing I've ever seen. I jab again. He moves, and I miss. I lean in for a right hook to the body, and he ducks. He lunges and wraps his arms around me. My back is to his broad chest, and his arms are wrapped around me like a vice, not leaving an inch of space between our bodies. I feel his hard dick on my ass, and to tease him, I stick my butt out further. He moans in my ear, and when I lean back, he licks the side of my neck. The throbbing between my legs doubles. I don't know when it happens, but we start to sway right there in the middle of the empty living room. We're in perfect rhythm. His muscled chest and hard cock pressed behind me, and my ass rests on his dick as if that's its home. A hand slides down my body and cups my pussy over my gray dress pants. I moan wantonly and grind into him. Warm lips press on the side of my neck while a hand undoes the top button to my pants. He slides inside my silk panties and glides between my lips. I can feel the slickness between my legs. His fingers slip lower and two find their way inside. He fucks me with his fingers, but all too soon he withdraws. I groan in protest, but he ignores me. That hand glides up my body, up my neck, and to my mouth. See how good you taste, he whispers so close to my ear that I get goosebumps. I open my mouth to take in a breath of air, and he puts the fingers that were inside of me in my mouth. Suck, Mel. He fucks my mouth with his fingers. Good, he asks. He sucks the base of my neck so hard, I know there will be a mark there tomorrow. So good, I whimper. We're still swaying, but his free arm is no longer wrapped around me. He's too busy unbuttoning my blouse. In no time at all, it's completely open and I'm shrugging it off. His shirt is pulled over his head and tossed to the floor while I rid myself of my shoes and pants. He takes off my bra, and I pull down my panties. When we're naked and standing in front of each other, I jump into his arms and wrap my legs around him. He catches me without so much as a flinch. He sprints to the bedroom and tosses me on the bed. Before I can get comfortable, he grabs one of my legs and pulls me to the edge of the bed, spreading me apart, leaving me completely exposed and at his mercy. His knuckles rub against my clit, and I whisper, Adam. He spreads my legs further apart and lays his big body on top of mine. Say it again, he commands. Say your husband's name. He grinds into me, and I can feel his heavy, thick cock between my legs. It's so close. If I can just adjust my body a bit, he could slip right in, but he presses me to the bed. Say your husband's name, love, he whispers again. 
I almost combust at the endearment. I touch his chest and run my hands over the scarred skin. Say it. Adam. I lower my voice and say his name. Kiss me, Adam. His blue eyes darken, and he crashes his mouth to mine. He's hungry, kissing me so hard and deep that I know he'll bruise my lips. Strong hands hold on to my hips while he continues to grind. Without breaking the kiss, he flips us over. Oh. I say, shocked by the sudden movement. Ride me. He slaps my ass and sits against the headboard. He lifts me. It's so effortless. He aligns his dick with my slit, and I'm so wet that I slide down his throbbing manhood. He thrusts hard, piercing me and filling me to the hilt. I grind down, and he goes up. I lean down and kiss his neck. He groans so loudly, it fills the room. I bite his earlobe, and he shudders. Goosebumps spread over his body, and I bite the taut skin on his collarbone. We fuck so hard, the headboard slams against the wall, but neither one of us cares. I can't get enough of him, and when he reaches over and takes one of my stiff nipples into his hot mouth, I throw my head back and call his name again. He sucks and pulls my nipple before turning his attention to the next one. The entire time, he never lets go of my hips. With this position, you'd think I'd be the one in control, but that couldn't be further from the truth. He's controlling all of my moves, how deep he goes, and how much pleasure he gives me. He owns my body, and for the moment, I let him have all of me. He holds me tight as I grind and ride him until the feeling of euphoria overtakes me and I come loudly on his cock. He's not far behind. He grunts and pumps a few more times before he slams his eyes shut and moans my name. I collapse on top of him. He's still in a sitting position and I lay my head on the side of his sweaty neck. I roll off and lie naked on top of the bedspread. He comes close to me and pulls me to his side. I wrap a leg around him, and I know my dripping pussy is leaking on his skin, but neither one of us cares. He reaches over and tweaks one of my nipples and I bite my lip at the sensation. You're so beautiful. I blush. It's been years since I've had a boyfriend, and even then, I don't remember anyone ever calling me beautiful before. You don't have to say those things. We're already married. I think maybe you need to hear it. I try to pull away, but he holds me to him. As much as I love his body and how strong he is, I hate how he can easily subdue me. There aren't many people who can. Don't, I warn. Don't what? Don't feel bad or sorry for me about my relationship with my mother. I learned a long time ago to accept it for what it is. His fingertips glide along my nipples again, calming me. I wait for him to lie and say he doesn't feel bad or sorry. Underneath the anger I felt radiating from him, I saw the look in his eyes. It's the same one Alex gives me whenever she's around me and my mother. But neither Alex nor Adam would ever understand. Adam's mother adores him, and I know Alex's mother did too before she passed away. Has it been like that all your life? he asks. Pretty much. At least as long as I can remember, but things really went south with us on the day of my high school graduation. Jason had graduated college that year, and I overheard her talking to my aunt. In a nutshell, she was proud of Jason for graduating top of his class and getting into medical school, whereas I barely made it out of high school. At least that's what she said, but that wasn't true. I just didn't get into any of the colleges she was hoping for. She told my aunt that at least she had one kid she could be proud of. I don't see pity in his eyes, but they become angry. A muscle in his jaw ticks, but he pulls me closer and I lay my head on his chest. The sound of his heart calms me, and I tell Adam everything I overheard that morning. I've never told anyone that before, 
I whisper afterwards. Not Jason. Not my dad. Not anyone. How do you tell anyone that you heard your mother say she regrets having you? I always thought it would hurt too much to speak those words, but telling you is freeing, Adam. I'm glad you're telling me, love, he whispers. So, I take a deep breath and tell him more. Our relationship never recovered. I went to college, but it took me five years to finish. I hardly went home. I would stay with my aunt. The part one regret the most is that I took my hurt and anger out on Jason. I picked a fight with him that day and told him I hated him. I can still see the hurt in his eyes. He's been nothing but good to me. Always. Even when I was horrible to him. My eyes fill with tears at the thought of wasting all those years being angry towards him. He's a smart guy. Sort of. I playfully punch him, and he laughs. Even if he doesn't know the specifics, I'm sure he knows your mother played a part in everything that happened. He couldn't have been too mad because he asked you to come live with him. That was only after I was in trouble again. I lost my job and found myself in some legal trouble. Jason hired a lawyer who got the charges dismissed. My mother pounced when that happened. It's like it proved her point about me always being a screw-up and a troublemaker. She brought it up her first night here. He kisses my forehead and says, We all do dumb things when we're young, Mel. We do dumb things when we're older too. We're all human. What's important is that we learn from them. I've made my share of mistakes, he says. Tell me one of them. I lay a hand on his flat belly. He lifts it and intertwines our fingers. He kisses the back of my hand and rests our joined hands on his chest. I was an angry teenager. My father was never around. I have no memory of my parents together as a couple. I can count on two hands how many times I've seen him in my life. I didn't understand why I was so angry until I became an adult. Back then, I didn't know how to channel it, so I got into fights. I kicked a lot of ass. My mother didn't know what to do or how to handle me. I started skipping school and was on a very dark path. She knew I liked to fight, so she took me down to this gym and paid for boxing lessons. I loved it. She didn't intend for it to go as far as it did, but I was good. She begged me to stop when I got older, but I wouldn't. It became a kind of therapy for me. It wasn't until I broke my elbow and strained my rotator cuff that things changed. She cried and stayed at my bedside the entire time. I was told it was best for me not to pursue fighting as a career, and seeing how upset my mother was, I decided to give it up, but the anger came back, I was 19 by then, and I was out one night, and someone started mouthing off. I tried to ignore it at first, but they said the wrong thing and I beat them to a pulp. I got arrested. He pressed charges. I sit up in surprise at the story. The Adam I've always known annoyed me, but he would never hurt a fly. The way he is with Addison is proof of his gentle nature. In the years since he's lived here, I've noticed how much of a giver he is. He's the guy who cleans the yard in the fall, shovels snow in the winter and never asks for anything back. I have a hard time picturing you hurting anybody, I tell him. I'm not proud of it, but I was a 19-year-old kid with daddy issues who didn't know he had issues. So, what happened? My father sent a lawyer and made everything disappear, he says simply. What happened between him and your mother? I ask. I guess he wasn't relationship material. Like I said, I don't remember them ever being together. I think maybe a kid might have been too much for a selfish prick like him. My heart hurts for him at the admission. The most he could do was support me financially, but out of sight out of mind I guess. Well, not only was he an asshole, 
but he was stupid too. He missed out on having an amazing son. He smiles shyly at me, and I run a hand through his hair. If he wasn't already dead, I'd find him and beat his ass. He rolls his eyes but pulls me closer. I'll have to teach you some of the basics before you try and kick anybody's ass. The few times you did see him, how was he? Was he happy to see you? He shrugs and says, I think he was excited to see my mom more than me. She'd agree to let him visit because he would say he wanted to see me, but it was his way of seeing her. He took me out for ice cream once, I think. But what about your relationship with your dad? You don't leave when he visits. I look into his eyes, and he smiles at me. Whenever your mom would visit, you'd leave after a day, but that's not the case with your dad. He's okay. We've gotten better. He never made me feel bad when I was growing up, but he admitted that he could have done more as a father and that he could have told mom to fuck off. His words, I say to him. So, me and my dad are good. Have you told him about us yet? I'm going to tell him tomorrow. He's not judgmental like my mom, so he'll be fine. 23. Adam Mel talks some more about her dad and asks me more about mine, but I manage to change the subject before she can delve further about my father. He's not someone I ever talk about, and the people who are close to me know never to bring him up. I avoid thinking about him at all costs, but these daily phone calls keep him in my thoughts. Lately, every time I look in the mirror, I think of him and wish I inherited my looks from my mom's side, but I didn't. From my dark hair to the blue eyes to my height. There's no denying that I'm his son. The one he didn't want and hid. The one he never bothered to get to know. I shake my head and do my best to clear it of things I can't change. I decide to focus on my wife instead because our relationship is something I'm hoping to change. That bullshit I told her about giving our marriage a year was just that. Bullshit. There's no way I'm letting her go after a year. Not even after a thousand years. What do you think? She shoves the laptop in my face. It won't be too expensive. Just some food, drinks, and a few friends. That amount, she says, pointing her index finger at the bottom of the screen, is just an estimate, but I'm pretty sure I can keep it close. And I won't use the credit card. I can pay for this. From the emergency or secret savings? I do my best to hide my smile, but fail. Neither, she huffs. I would never dip into my savings for a party, she says, aghast at the very thought. And you shouldn't either. Please tell me. I slam the laptop shut and put it on the nightstand, cutting off whatever she was going to say. I lay flat on my back and pull her on top of my hardening dick. You have the credit card. Use it. I mean it. I promise I'm not going to be in financial ruin if you buy stuff. She opens her mouth to argue with me, but I kiss her until she's breathless. Just kiss your husband, Mrs. Flynn. I kiss her again and all thoughts about money must leave her mind because she kisses me back. I skipped my afternoon session at the gym and rushed home as soon as school let out. Tomorrow might be a late day. I need to finalize the spring sports and need to figure out what I'm going to coach, but all of that can wait because I promised Mel I'd come home to help with the new furniture. When I open the front door to the house, I can hear voices and movement upstairs. Just as I take the stairs, I hear laughter. Hers mixed with a male. I barge through the door, but I don't see my wife. What I do find is a tall black man standing in the middle of my living room. He's so engrossed in what he's looking at that he doesn't see me. I walk closer and follow his line of vision. I drop my bag on the floor with a loud thud, but he still hasn't noticed me. Mel has the fridge door open, and she's bending down. She's in black yoga pants and an orange sweatshirt, but the shirt rides up, revealing the smooth skin of her lower back. When she straightens, she comes back with two bottles of water and a smile on her face. 
That's when I hear a door down the hall open and another man comes out. This one is short with a belly the shape of a basketball. Here you go, Mel says, handing each of them a bottle of water. She sees me and smiles, but I don't smile back. I walk over and kiss her so deep, so indecent, I know she'll be blushing when I pull away. And I'm right. Color creeps up her neck and she swats my chest. What do you think? She waves around the apartment, and for the first time, I notice the new furniture. You two all sit here? I lock eyes with the tall one, and he smirks at me. I leave Mel's side and step to him, ready to beat him through the floor. You check out my wife's ass one more time, and you and I will have problems. The kind of problem where you'll need a gurney to get out of here, I whisper, and he wisely steps back. All set, he says. Just sign here, and we'll get out of your hair. He hands Mel an iPad, and she signs. I stare at them until they practically run out of the front door. Her top might be a sweatshirt, but it's a crop top. It shows off her tapered waist and her smooth skin. She has matching high top sneakers, and when my eyes travel back up her body, her hair is in a high ponytail. She smiles and spins around the room. Her ass jiggles and my pants tighten. Doesn't it look great? She hooks her arms through mine, and we walk to the couch. It's a large sectional, and the end has a seat that leans back like a lazy boy. It's gray, and when I run my hand over it, it's smooth. There's a tall plant in the corner. There are plants everywhere. Come on. She takes my hand, and we walk to the kitchen. She opens a cabinet and pulls out a plate. They all match. Even the mugs and glasses. The plate is white and is decorated with a green leaf in the middle. There's a vase of fresh flowers on the kitchen table. She grabs it and puts it to my nose, and I inhale. Nice, but not as nice as when I have my face between your legs. I hold her elbow and sniff her neck. She shakes her head at me and takes my hand in hers. I got some artwork for the walls. I hope you like them. This rug looked nice online, but now I'm not so sure. I look at the walls and the floor. They both look fine to me. It's beautiful, Mel, I reassure her. She takes me to the bathroom next. The rugs are different, as is the shower curtain. The colors are definitely more feminine. No way I would buy a shower curtain with pink flowers, but whatever. It does give me a certain feeling of possessiveness to see her things all over my bathroom sink. Right in the middle is a wicker basket full of nothing but nail polish. Every color of the rainbow. All with strange names like mint candy apple, high maintenance, and moochie moochie. Whatever the fuck moochie moochie means. And I got new bedding for the bedroom. I follow her into our room, and again, a bunch of girly shit, but I don't care. There's a vase of pink roses on the dresser, a floral comforter, and matching sheets and pillowcases. I can't wait to fuck you on that bed tonight, I whisper in her ear. She puts a hand on my chest and moans loudly. I grab her ass and squeeze. You're going to have to wait. I hope you don't mind, but I invited Alex and Jason for dinner, so I have to start cooking. Oh, and you see all the plants we have? Yeah, I say, smiling at the fact that she said we. Even the two in the windowless bathroom, I tease. Well, I have the opposite of a green thumb, but I love plants. So, you're responsible for keeping them alive. What? Me? Mel, I don't know anything about plants. You saw how I lived before you moved in. I leave the bedroom, and she follows me. There are plants all along the hallway. There are three in the kitchen alone. They all have instructions. She plants both hands on my chest and says, Please. I sigh, roll my eyes, and nod. Yes, she exclaims and hugs me. I lean down and kiss her lips. Anything for you, even this damn rainforest we call a home. She wraps an arm around mine and we walk back to the living room. 
What do you think about Lola? She asks. Who the hell is Lola? That's what I named your ugly chair. I was going to have her reupholstered, but decided not to since I promised not to touch it. And did you know that reupholstering costs almost as much as getting a new chair? Got this blanket instead. She leaves my side, runs to the coat closet, and comes back holding something pink. I groan when I see it. She runs a piece across my cheek, and I admit it's soft. She drapes it over my chair and gestures to it. First off, that chair is a man's chair. He should have a manly name like Gus or Chuck, not Lola. And you couldn't find a more masculine blanket? She smiles smugly at me and sits in my chair. Whoa. No one sits on Lola but me. I grab her feet and pull her off. She does her best to hold onto the chair, but I'm too strong. As soon as I have her on the floor, I jump over her and take my place in my favorite chair. I drape the blanket over me and sigh. I'll never admit it to her, but the blanket is comfortable and long enough for my body. She stands, and I grab her hand and pull her into my lap. Everything is beautiful, Mel. Everything but this girly blanket. She surprises me when she kisses my cheek. The blanket stays, Flynn. Okay, Flynn, I say back to her. All too soon she jumps off my lap. I have to make dinner. Do you want a snack? She starts to walk away, but I grab her wrist. You'd bring me a snack? Sure. Why wouldn't I? Relax a little until dinner since you wake up so early. I drop her wrist and she leaves. She comes back a few minutes later with a tray. There's Greek yogurt, fruit, and a few slices of salami and cheese. She gives it to me, hands me the remote, and leaves. I inhale it in under two minutes and wish she had brought more. I lean back on Lola, spread my blanket over my body, and relax to the sounds of my wife cooking in our kitchen. I look around the place again, amazed at how a fresh coat of paint, new furniture, and a few plants can give the apartment new life. Mel, I invited a few colleagues over on Saturday, I yell. Sounds great. I talk to my dad, and he's coming, she says back. I grab the remote and put on ESPN. The only thing missing is a dog, but maybe that's something we can talk about later. I close my eyes for a few minutes. It's two hours later when she wakes me up from my slumber. She takes my empty snack tray and orders me to shower before our guests come over. Twenty minutes later, I'm freshly showered and dressed. Mel changed into blue jeans and a light blue sweater. Just as I reach for plates to set the table, there's a knock on the door. I fling the door open and Addie runs straight to Mel. Jason and Alex follow behind her and before I can close the door, her mother walks in. There are awkward glances exchanged between Jason and Mel. He approaches her in the kitchen, and they have a quiet conversation. Alex follows them, giving me a fake smile along the way. I didn't ask Mel if she invited her mother to dinner. I just assumed she didn't. The place looks nice, Diane says to me. A big improvement since I was here the last time, but I guess it was a bachelor pad before you and Melanie got married. I stare at her unsure of how to respond. For once, there's nothing snarky in what she said, and when I look deeper into her eyes, I can sense her nervousness. Yeah, she worked her magic. I don't smile at her because that would be a betrayal to Mel, but I can't find it in me to kick her out either. At least not yet. Mel looks at me, and I wait for her to give me the sign to show her mother the door, but Addie comes and wraps her arms around one of my legs, and I pick her up. Adam, Mel says, Why don't you show Alex and Jason the place? She doesn't mention her mother, but when I tell Alex and Jason to follow me, Diane does too. I put Addison on my shoulder and give them the quick tour of the apartment. Lots of plants in here, Alex says. Which I'm responsible for, I was told. 24. Melly. My mood is too upbeat to deal with my mother crashing our impromptu dinner party. 
she was supposed to stay downstairs and watch Addison while the four of us have dinner. I never expected her to show up, and judging from the strained look on Alex's face, she either didn't know or couldn't talk her out of it. But it doesn't matter. Today's been a great day. I interviewed three strong candidates for the position at work, and the apartment turned out better than I could have hoped for. I can't help the smile on my face while I pull a roast out of the oven. When I lift the lid off my Dutch oven, a cloud of smoke hits me in the face and the delicious aroma of the roast makes my stomach grumble. Luckily it doesn't come apart when I put it on a new serving platter. As I reach the cabinets to grab the dishes, I feel someone walking behind me. I grab four plates, but when I notice my mother standing there me, the smile slips from my face. Not wanting a fight or a confrontation, I walk away and place the dishes on the new placemats. Can I do anything to help? Her voice is tentative and doesn't hold the usual tinge of judgment or disappointment. I got it, but thanks. I walk around her and get glasses. Since Alex can't drink, I don't bother with the new wine glasses. Adam's not much of a drinker, and I know Jason's on call tonight. It smells good. This time she offers a smile, which I don't return. Were you expecting Pop-Tarts? I immediately regret my words. I shake my head and say, whatever this is, mother, I don't have the time for it right now. I've had a really good day, and I don't need you to trample on my self-esteem tonight, okay? I thought you were going to watch the baby. She takes a step closer and reaches for my hand, but I flinch as if she burned me. She sighs sadly at my rejection, and for a split second, I feel bad, but I shove that feeling down. It was never my intention to, she doesn't get a chance to finish her statement. Everyone returns to the kitchen. Alex is laughing at something Adam said, and Jason is shaking his head. You ready to go downstairs with Grandma, Addie? Jason takes Addie from Adam's shoulder and tosses her in the air. Her giggles fill the room, and I can't help but laugh too. Adam walks over, throws an arm across my shoulder, and kisses my cheek. What can I do to help? And that smells great, love, he whispers in my ear. I stay. Addie yells. She wraps her arms around Jason, and I know there's no way he can send her away. I don't want him to. Everyone stays, I concede. Sit down, I tell my guests. Adam and I will bring the food. I grab two extra placemats and plates. We rinse the dishes side by side. It's a total team effort. I rinse and he puts them in the dishwasher. Every so often, he'll lean over and kiss my temple for no reason at all. He did that all throughout dinner too, and each time I'd catch Alex's eye and she'd smile at me. Dinner was great because I did not allow my mother to ruin it. For the most part, she stayed quiet and helped with Addie. Alex and Jason did most of the talking. I went on with the meal as if she wasn't there. In fact, I avoided looking at her and focused on the people I invited. Dinner was good, right? I finally say. Adam bumps his shoulder with mine. It was great. You throw a mean dinner party, Mrs. Flynn. We'll have to invite your mom and uncle for dinner one day. Maybe in a couple of weeks since they'll be here for the party this weekend. My mom would love that. You think Uncle Finn will wear his hearing aid? Not a chance in hell. We both laugh, and once the dishes are done, I wipe down the counter and start the dishwasher. Adam goes to the bedroom, and I take a quick shower. By the time I return, he's under the covers, and just like the previous nights, I can tell he's naked. I pull the sash of my robe and slide underneath the sheets. Adam pulls me close. His hand goes up my t-shirt, and he cups my bare pussy. 25, Melly. 
Adam's mom shows up half an hour early for our nail appointment. Her jaw nearly falls to the ground when she walks in and sees how the place has transformed. It's only been a few days, but I love our little apartment more each second. Adam's taking his plant duties seriously. He even rearranged some to ensure they are getting the correct amount of light needed. He went so far as to order fertilizer sticks online. I'm so glad my son has you, Molly says to me. She pushes a piece of hair behind my ear and pinches my cheek. A giggle escapes at the unexpected gesture. She's very touchy, which I'm not used to from a mother figure. She must have hugged us at least three times already. You finally live in a grown-up place, and all you had to do was get married. She playfully slaps Adam upside the head, and he pretends to be hurt. So, there's nothing you need to do while we're gone, I tell my husband. I picked up the alcohol yesterday and the food won't be delivered until four. I reach up and he leans down to kiss my lips. Yes, dear. I'll go get a workout in while you two are gone. He helps me with my coat and opens the door for me and his mother. We walk down the stairs, and when we get to Jason's door, it opens and my mother steps out. Melanie. She pretends to be surprised to see me. I imagine she's been standing behind the door waiting for us to come down. I'm kicking myself for not going out the back. Mother. She stares at us. My mother raises both eyebrows when she notices Molly's arm hooked through mine. She crosses her arms and waits. This is my mother-in-law, Molly Flynn. Molls, I say, using the nickname I've given her, this is my mother, Diane Dupree. Molly hugs my mother. Mom doesn't pull away, but she remains stiff. I see the resemblance, Molly says. I'm looking forward to the party tonight and meeting some of Mel's family. And I can't wait for all of us to go wedding dress shopping. My mother clears her throat and nods. She looks at me, probably waiting for an invitation to the bridal boutique, but I don't offer one. I know she's heard about the housewarming, but I didn't invite her to that either. There's a part of me that feels a twinge of guilt, but there's the part who's worked so hard on not focusing on the damage my mother's done to me. The part that wants me to be at peace. And where are you two headed now? My mother's eyes never leave our joined arms. Just some girl time. I finally have a daughter. Molly puts her head on my shoulder. Manis and Petis. You should join us. I visibly cringe at the sudden invitation. My mother looks at me, and I can tell she's holding her breath. She's probably waiting for me to invite her, but I can't think of a single time where we did anything like that together. Not even when I was a preteen. The sad thing is, I don't remember ever wanting to do this with her, and that includes today. Maybe another time, I say quickly. You're not dressed and we don't want to be late. I still have a lot to do to get ready for the party. My mother casts her eyes down, but she looks back up, puts a smile on her face, and says, of course. I'll see you upstairs later. She looks me directly in the eyes then, almost daring me to tell her she's not invited. The apartment will be full of people. I don't give a hoot if she's there or not so I nod and pull Molly towards the door. The ride to the salon isn't a long one, and I sink into the leather seats of Molly's Nissan Rogue while she chats. Her voice is cheery, and I find myself liking her Irish brogue. The salon is practically empty, which is not unexpected on a very cold January day. We're served quickly, and both of us decide on French manicures and pedicures. When we're done, we pick up lunch from my favorite Greek place and take it home. Thankfully, my mother is not waiting for us when we get back. While I grab plates, Molly walks around again. She smiles when she runs a hand over the blanket draped across Lola. While we eat, 
She tells me stories about young Adam and the years they spent in Ireland. My mother was sick. I went back to help take care of her, she says. Were you too close? She wipes her mouth and tosses the napkin on the table. Hardly, darling. I could barely wait to get away from her. As soon as I could, I put an entire ocean between us. She was controlling with a mean streak. She wanted me to be a nun. She rolls her eyes at that declaration, and I laugh at the irritated look on her face. A nun? Wow. Yes, and I'm her youngest child and none of my sisters wanted it, so I was her last chance. She was sorely disappointed, but I had my own life to live. Then, I have a baby out of wedlock, and she was not happy about that. At least not until I took Adam to meet her when he was about one. It's funny how grandparents can treat their grandkids so much better than they did their own children. She fell in love with Adam the second she saw him. She doted on him, and he worshipped her. She was completely different with him than she was with me. I reach over and put a hand on top of hers. I was so in love with Adam's father, but he didn't feel the same toward me. I guess his feelings were more carnal, and once I realized that, I left. I wanted so much more in a relationship than he could have given me. Leaving him was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I did it. To his credit, he took care of Adam financially, but he was never interested in him. He stopped coming around when he realized he wouldn't be getting in my pants anymore. She opens her mouth to say something else, but she stops suddenly and gives her head a small shake. It's almost as if she wants to say more but can't. You were young, Malls. And you aren't the first woman to love a man and not have those feelings returned. But the fact that you walked away shows how strong you are. You knew you deserved better, and he was a fool. Her eyes pool with tears, and she nods. It took me years to come to that realization. I felt an incredible amount of guilt about not giving Adam a traditional family. He's so full of love, and he deserves the best of everything. I tried to be a good mother to him, but I couldn't be his father, you know. He was such a good boy, so I was lucky. Other than that boxing nonsense where he got himself hurt, he's been a mother's dream. She smiles wistfully. You didn't seem surprised or upset that we got married suddenly. No, she waves a hand as if the very idea of being upset at Adam is ridiculous. I trust my son, and I saw the way he looked at you those two times I saw you. I always told myself that I would love the woman he ended up with. I didn't want to be anything like my mother, a judgmental shrew who found no joy in anything. I asked him about it. Remember that time you barged in and left? He winked at me and said, Just wait, Ma. And you're so wonderful for him, Mel. And you're going to give me grandbabies. I blush at the thought. The notion that our marriage is temporary comes to mind, but I shove it away, refusing to think about that now. Not right away, Molly, I warn her, but that only makes her smile wider. As long as you're not telling me never. And I want us to have girly time. When I was pregnant with Adam, I prayed every night he would be a girl. I bought a pink dress. Don't tell him, but I put him in it once. I might have a picture somewhere. She winks at me, and we both burst into laughter while I think of my very masculine husband in a pink dress. We finish our food, and while I clear the table and wash the dishes, Molly reaches into her purse and pulls something out. When I'm wiping down the counter, she approaches. I didn't get a chance to do this when you and Adam were over at the house, but I want you to have this. She opens a square jewelry box and pulls out a gold chain with a cross. It's the same one Adam wears, and I've noticed that Molly has one too. I gave Adam his when he was going through his rebellious teenage phase. I told him it would protect him, 
and since you're my daughter now, I want you to have one. I fan my face to dry my sudden tears. Molly stands behind me and puts the chain around my neck. I'm not religious, I say, so choked I can hardly speak. You don't have to be, darling. This isn't about religion. This is because you're my daughter now, and I want our Savior's protection around my kids. I walk away and look at the mirror hanging on the wall behind the living room. It was one of the things that was delivered with the furniture. I run my hand over it, and this time, I can't stop the tears from falling. Thank you, Molly. This means so much to me. My words come out hoarse, and I clear my throat twice. She smiles and opens her arms. She's a slender woman, but she holds me tight. Adam walks in while we're in the middle of our hug. He smiles when he sees us, shrugs off his coat, and wraps us in his arms. You're sweaty and gross. He doesn't care because he grabs my face and kisses me deeply right in front of his mother. When he finally ends the kiss, he doesn't move away or drop his hands. He peppers my lips with feather-soft kisses. Go shower, I say between kisses. You have to help me set up for the party. He finally steps away from me, but he kisses his mother's cheek before running to our bedroom. Why don't you stick around until the party, Molly? I can fix us some drinks. She smiles and walks to the coat closet. I'd love to, but I have to get Finn. He's not only deaf, but he's blind as a bat at night. Twenty-six. Melly. The talking is drowned by the loud whirring of the blender. Jason yells something, and a few ladies circle around him, holding their margarita glasses so he can pour. The blender and margarita glasses are another thing I got two days ago, courtesy of Amazon and their next day delivery. I catch Adam's eye from across the room, and he winks at me. I wink back, and when I look up, Ananda is giving me a smug look. Lying ass. Even from across the room, I can read her lips. She leaves her husband's side, walks over to me, and fingers the small gold chain around my neck. My new jewelry is on full display tonight since I decided on a red v-neck sweater to go with my short, black denim skirt. My outfit is complete with black ankle boots. This is new, Ananda says. The shrewd look in her eyes tells me she knows exactly where the necklace came from. I decide to ignore her and sip my margarita, but she waves Alex over. Have you seen your sister-in-law's new jewelry, Alexandra? Ananda asks. Ugh, you know I hate being called that, and yes. It's sparkling from across the room. Alex reaches over and runs a finger along the cross. I'm feeling pious just being near you, Melly. Whatever, I say, waving them off. Maybe I've had too many drinks, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but that looks just like the one Adam wears. And it would also appear that his mother has one too. Hmm. I wonder what the connection could be. They both tap their temple with a finger before they look at each other and burst into laughter. Fine. His mother gave it to me. Are you bitches happy now? They laugh harder. Was it before or after you got matching Moni Pedis? After, ho, I say to Ananda, throwing her favorite word back at her. I look around the room and spot my mother in a deep conversation with Molly and I narrow my eyes. Alex, go get your mother-in-law. And why isn't she downstairs watching Addie? I didn't invite her. Addie has a sitter, and I think Jason tried to talk her out of it. My mother is smiling at whatever Molly is saying. I look away, suddenly not caring that she's here. Her issues with me have always stayed within the immediate family. Whatever. I'm going to enjoy my party. Just as the words leave my mouth, Adam comes over and takes my hand. 
Come meet some of my colleagues, love, he whispers in my ear right before he kisses my temple. Oh, Adam. Ananda gives me a sly look once she has Adam's attention, Melly told us you too are considering Paris for your honeymoon. Considering. I thought you had your heart set on Paris, love. I've already booked us a hotel. I do, I tell him quickly. Ananda doesn't know what the hell she's talking about. I turn to my friend and narrow my eyes at her. Sorry, love, Ananda says. I must have misunderstood. She cackles and twists her lips. Then, she smirks as if she just proved a point. Alex's cheeks pin Ken and she sips her water. Adam pulls me away and introduces me to a couple of teachers at his school, along with the office administrator. We chat for a while, but then my father walks in holding hands with a tall and very beautiful woman. Jason and I both get our height from our father. In fact, Dad is about an inch taller than Jason, and his date's shoulders practically reach his. Her hair is short but perfectly styled. She's holding on to his hand while she nervously looks around. It's my smelly Melly, Dad says as he approaches. Just like my brother, he's extremely loud. He drops his date's hand, pulls me away from Adam, and lifts me off my feet. Hey, Dad. By the time he spins me around and puts me down, I'm breathless. Look at you, looking so pretty. And where's my new son-in-law? He puts a hand over his eyes and makes a show of looking around the room. I grab Adam's hand, intertwine our fingers and raise our joined hands in front of my dad. I even point at our wedding bands with my free hand. Dad, this is Adam Flynn, my husband. Adam, this is my dad, William Dupree. Get the hell out of here, my dad teases. He playfully punches my shoulder as he starts to sing Ebony and Ivory. I feel the color creep up my neck in embarrassment, but all Adam does is laugh at my dad's lame joke. Come here, son. Dad hugs him, and when he pulls away, he introduces us to his date. This is Jennifer. Jennifer, meet my daughter Melanie. She's a boss lady at her job now. For the past two years, my dad makes it a point to tell me how proud he is of me in every conversation. I smile and shake Jennifer's hand. She has a deep dimple in each cheek, and her brown eyes look extremely kind. Jason and Alex approach, and are introduced to her as well. We're only here until tomorrow afternoon, so I want to take all of you out to breakfast in the morning. I want to spend time with my granddaughter too, he says. Then he lowers his voice and whispers, your mother ain't invited, right before he lets out a loud laugh. In fact, I'm surprised she's up here, but I guess she needs to sink her talons in Jason every chance she gets. Dad, come on, Jason says. Sorry. I'm sure she's here to spread her goodness and light, like always. He does an exaggerated eye roll. I want to spend some time with Adam and Alex. Make sure you two are treating them right. He points at me and Jason and offers Alex his arm. I want you to get to know Jennifer, he whispers in my ear. Let's go get a drink, Jennifer, I tell her. I'd love to. And this is a beautiful apartment. I hook my arm through hers as Jason follows us to the kitchen. You should have seen it before I moved in. Jason makes us fresh margaritas while I chat with Jennifer. She's only 42 but has a 20-year-old daughter who goes to Boston University. She's a hairdresser by trade, but she owns three beauty salons in New Jersey. Your father tells me you're having a wedding. He's really excited about walking you down the aisle. No pressure, but I'd love to do your hair for your big day. If you already have someone else. I'd love it, I tell her before she can finish her thought. She lets out a relieved breath. 
I look past her shoulders and catch my mother looking at us. Let me show you some pictures of the last few weddings I did. I can do makeup too. She pulls out her phone and starts to swipe. 27. Adam. Adam. Uncle Finn yells while he walks across the room. What is this? A funeral? I thought you invited me here for a party. You need some music. Alex puts a hand to her chest at my uncle's loud voice, and my mother shakes her head from across the room. It's fine, Uncle Finn, I say. Wine? I can't mix wine with the whiskey I've been drinking. I'm Irish, Adam. I don't do wimpy drinks like wine. Millie giggles, and I wrap my arm tighter around her. Oh, and Adam, before I leave, I want you to help with that dating profile we talked about. I'm sick of being single. I can help you, Uncle Finn, Ananda volunteers. Kelp? What kelp? She's Mashugana, that one, he says, jerking his thumb in her direction. She said she'll help, I yell loud enough so he can hear. I hope he takes her up on it because I don't want to bother. Thank you, lovely. I'm gonna take your offer. Adam, he says. Like always, he says my name louder than necessary. He's been putting me off for months. I think he likes having Uncle Finn at his beck and call. No more, Adam. I'm getting a lady friend, so you'll have to learn to share. He turns back to Ananda and asks, Do you dance because these hips don't lie? He starts to gyrate in the middle of the living room. She nods slowly, eyes wide almost as if she's afraid of what Uncle Finn is going to do next. He pulls out his phone and walks away. Ananda exhales, but seconds later, loud salsa music fills the room. Uncle Finn walks back, takes Ananda's hand and leads her to the middle of the living room and spins her around. I pray that Ananda can keep up with him. He's like a savant when it comes to dancing. Whoa! Mel's jaw almost hits the floor at the sight of Uncle Finn dancing around the apartment. Luckily for Ananda, she can keep up. Yeah. Uncle Finn dances away from Ananda, holding rhythm the entire time. He grabs Jennifer's hand and pulls her away from William. Two ladies at once, Uncle Finn yells, and everyone laughs. I wrap my arm around Mel and pull her back into my chest. How about you, love? You feel like dancing with your husband? I put my hands on her hips and move them to the beat of the music. She pushes her hips from side to side, and each time she moves, her ample ass hits my dick. If you're anything like Uncle Finn, I don't know if I can keep up. I lean down and kiss the top of her ear. She shudders and tries to pull away, but I nip her earlobe. I know for a fact you can keep up. The music changes and a song with a slower tempo comes on. I spin her around, pull her body flush with mine, and we move our hips to the sound of the music. Adam. Uncle Finn yells from two feet away. It's about the hundredth time he's yelled my name tonight. My friend here set up a dating profile for me. She says I'm a silver fox. Everyone laughs at my uncle, and I shake my head. Just like Kevin Costner, Ananda practically yells in his ear. She's Mashugana, that one. And Kevin Costner wishes. I ignore my uncle and look across the room. My mom is laughing with Mel while her mom looks on. I can't read her expression, but Jason walks over there, and a smile lights up her face. I turn away and put out more chips for our guests. They ate the tacos we got for dinner, and I ended up ordering pizza. So far, no one has left and the simple housewarming has turned into a party. Millie seems happy, William says, walking up to me. I almost fell over when she called and told me she got married. Yeah, it was sudden, is all I say. My wife is across the room talking to my mom and Jennifer, gesturing wildly with her hands. She's oblivious to the stares coming from Diane. How do you like your mother-in-law? William asks. I don't. 
Almost as if she knows she's the subject of our conversation, she walks over to us. Jason sees and follows quickly behind her. William, she says, her lips pursed. You look well. Maybe a little ridiculous chasing around that young woman. I'd appreciate it if you would not besmirch my name to Adam. I hold in my snort. As if she hasn't besmirched her own name. I'm sure you did that all by yourself, sweetheart. And you also look well. Nice hairdo. Too bad it doesn't hide your horns. By the way, how's the house? He pops a chip in his mouth, but that does nothing to hide his satisfied smile. It widens when Diane takes a defensive step back. I see you're as big of a jerk as ever. And I see that you're as miserable as ever. Can we not do this now? Jason asks. I lean against the table, cross my arms, and watch the dynamics of the family I married into. All your father has to do is behave, and we won't. All your mother has to do is leave. Why are you here anyway, Diane? I know you've always had your hooks deep in Jason, but Melly can't stand you on your best day. I eat a disgusting chip and wait for Diane's response. Jason runs a hand over his face and sighs loudly. You'll say anything to hurt me. I'd have to care about you to hurt you, Diane. Just leave Millie alone. She was already dealt a bad hand in the mother department. She's in a good place now, so don't come over here and shit all over it. I don't need you to tell me how to be a parent. When it comes to our daughter, you do. I don't think Adam will put up with your bullshit. Diane's head pops up at the mention of my name. She purses her lips and turns her attention back to William. Look at you, William. Father of the year. It must be great to swoop in and be a father now. Where the hell were you when I was raising our two children? I was there, working two jobs. Never said I was father of the year. I made plenty of mistakes, so go ahead and judge me. I own my mistakes, Diane. Do you? The last comment from Williams seems to have left her speechless. She opens her mouth to speak, but nothing comes out. She closes her mouth, spins on her heels, and walks to the opposite end of the room. I wish she'd leave, but being far away from me works too. William looks, winks, and says, You're welcome. Did you have to say all of that to her, Dad? Jason asks. She's had a rough time lately. That's just karma giving her a kick in her judgmental rear end. Enough about her. Come make me another one of those drinks. Come on, Adam. I think you and I will get along great. While Jason makes a fresh batch of frozen margaritas, I lean against the kitchen counter and stare at Mel. She's oblivious to my stare and points at something on Uncle Finn's phone. Then she looks up, and our eyes lock. She blushes, but she blows me a kiss and looks away. The phone in my pocket vibrates, and I say a silent curse before reluctantly pulling my eyes away from my wife in that short skirt. They've started reaching out again. He's been leaving texts this time. Unknown number, I'll be in Boston next month. I want to meet. The fucking audacity of these people. Me, no. Since everyone I care about is here, I shut off my phone and put it in my pocket. You okay? Mel asks, sliding beside me. You looked at your phone and frowned. Spam is all I say. Junk texts. I unsubscribed. My voice sounds high to my own ears, but she seems to buy my lie. She nods and reaches around me for a slice of pizza. Our party's a hit, she says. Our first of many. It's many hours later when our last guests leave. It was fun to see the usually put-together Dr. Jason Dupree get drunk off the martinis Mel made. I had to help him down the stairs, and it made me happy to see his wife irritated with him. He couldn't even take off his shoes when I practically carried him into his bedroom. After making sure he was in bed, I left him to his angry spouse. Mel finishes wiping down the counter and I take the trash bags outside. 
When I return, it's back to our clean and pristine apartment. The place looks and smells great. Even though we didn't ask for gifts, our guests brought everything from kitchen gadgets to scented candles. So, love, I say putting my hands on either side of her, boxing her in. I've been watching your luscious ass in this tiny skirt all night. I slide my hand down her back and cup her butt. Now that everyone's gone, I think it's time you pay up for all the teasing you did. Because I know her ears are sensitive, I put her earlobe between my teeth. She moans and arches her back into me. Tell me, Mel, how did I end up with the sexiest wife in the history of the world? Hmm. I drop her earlobe and lick the side of her neck. While she moans at the sensation, I reach underneath the short skirt and grab her panty-covered pussy with my large palm. This is mine. From now until eternity. Fuck walking away in a year. Fuck walking away at all. I rub her clit over her panties. She whines and grinds on my dick, and she throws her head back and puts a palm on my cheek. I know what she wants, but I'm not ready to give it to her yet. Adam, she says so softly I can barely hear. Adam what? I whisper in her ear. I drop my hand from her pussy, and she moans in protest, but before she can get a word out, I spin her around to face me. Adam what? Mel? What do you want? She smiles coyly and puts a hand on my chest, biting her bottom lip as soon as her hand makes contact. She spent so much time watching me exercise in the backyard, and her eyes have always been drawn to my chest. I noticed her watching me the very first day. You make me feel beautiful. She drops her gaze, but I grab her chin and force her eyes back on me. That's because you are. And wanted. No one's ever wanted me like this. That's because you were only meant for me, love. No one else can make you feel the way I do. Do you know why? Her brown eyes lock with mine and no words come out of her mouth. All she can do is shake her head. Because you don't belong to them. You belong to me. I run my hands down her sides, caressing her curves along the way. She grabs my hands and leads me to the living room. She points to Lola, and when I sit, she dims the lights. Music is still playing from earlier, and Ed Sheeran's Shape of You comes on. I've always been self-conscious about everything. Until you came along and started looking at me as if you could see my soul. I glide my hand along her bare leg, but she steps back and starts to sway to the music. I sit up straight, entranced as she swings her hips. Just like the woman in the video, she starts to box, and my dick stands at attention. I sit back, unable to blink or breathe as I watch the most beautiful sight. She turns and gives me a nice view of her ass. The ass I've been obsessed with since I first saw it. She bends at the waist and looks at me through her legs. She runs her tongue over her bottom lip and slowly stands up. While the song continues to play, she rolls down her silk panties and throws them at me. I catch them with one hand, put them to my nose before I put them in my pocket. I have no plans on giving them back any time soon. The skirt comes off next, leaving her naked from the waist down. Her body is firm and shaped like an hourglass. My hands ache to touch her, but this is her show, and I'm her audience. She walks over, spreads her legs, showing her perfectly trimmed pussy. I see the tip of her pink little clit, and my tongue yearns for it. You put that pussy in my face, things can only end one way, love, I say. When she pulls the sweater over her head and removes her bra, I can't take it anymore. I stand, remove my shirt and t-shirt, and like a predatory animal, I approach and lift her off the ground. She wraps her legs around me, her hot, wet pussy coating my stomach. I look up into her eyes, and for the first time, she doesn't look away. She looks as if she's trying to read my mind. Fingers slide in my hair. There's a soft side before warm lips touch mine. I don't know how, but I manage to get us into the bedroom without hitting a wall. I lay her on her back and feast on her body. First her lips. 
Then I give her breasts my full attention. Her nipples are sensitive. I remember that from our night in my hotel room in Vegas. That's as far as I allow things to get despite my hard dick and my unquenching need to have her. But I didn't want her to have any regrets the next morning. While I suck on a nipple, she reaches for my belt. Knowing exactly what she wants, my shoes and jeans come off, both thrown into some dark corner of the bedroom. I bend her legs and dive into her pussy. She tastes like warm honey, and I can't get enough, but I stop before she comes on my mouth. Adam, she complains. I slide on top of her body and slide my dick into her in one hard thrust. Fuck, Adam, she says. No fucking. Tonight's for loving. I give it to her slow, filling her body as much as her mind. Eyes on me. Her eyes fly open. She sighs when our eyes lock. My thrusts are slow, reaching the deepest parts of her body and soul. You're so beautiful. So damn beautiful. I kiss the side of her mouth. I thrust into her again, and she comes apart underneath me, calling my name. Hearing my wife call out my name while she comes on my dick pushes me over the edge and I release inside of her. I stay inside until I soften and slip out. She cuddles to my side and I pull her closer, putting a hand on her stomach, wishing that our lovemaking could create a life, but I know she's on birth control and no amount of wishing will grant me the gift. At least not yet. That was amazing, she whispers. You're amazing, I say kissing her temple. 28. Melly. Tell me something nobody on earth knows about you. Not even your mom, I say to Adam hours after getting into bed. We fell asleep after making love, but when he got up to pee, he woke me up, and neither one of us were able to fall back asleep. He groans and says, okay, let me think. He stays quiet for a few minutes before speaking again. Okay, I got it. We moved to Dublin when I was ten. I broke a vase that belonged to some dead relative. My grandma found the broken vase the next morning and blamed Uncle Finn. He came home drunk the night before, so he assumed he did it and took the blame. I never told a soul until now. He plays with my cross and laughs at the memory. Oh, poor Uncle Finn. I can't help my own laugh. He apologized and everything. He was in the doghouse with my grandmother for a long time. Your turn. Tell me something, he says. I'm scared of the dark. I speak the words quickly, then I sit up and peek at his face. Get out, he says. Nope. I have a nightlight in my bedroom downstairs. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I put one in here. If I come to bed before you, I turn it on. The second you leave for the gym on those early mornings, that light goes on. Oh, love, I had no idea. I'll be sure to turn it on for you on those mornings, okay? Like he always does, he kisses my temple. Besides the dark, tell me what you're most afraid of in this world, he asks. Not being seen. Going through life and not doing anything important. I'm afraid of letting my insecurities keep me from the life I want. Your turn. Tell me something you're afraid of. Needles. His cheeks turn red in embarrassment, but that doesn't stop me from laughing. Needles. Big, strong Adam Flynn is afraid of needles. Get out of here. I shove his chest. Mel, big strong Adam would put up such a fight at the doctor's office. It would take four or five people to hold me down to get a vaccine. I picture that in my head, and I laugh so hard, I fall off the bed. Hey, I didn't laugh at your nightlight thing. That only makes me laugh harder. I laugh so hard and long that my stomach starts to hurt. Are you done? He stands over me and offers me his hand. When I take it, he yanks me to my feet. I'm sorry, Adam. 
I know I don't look the least bit contrite. Your secret is safe with me. He slides into the bed beside me and pulls me into his arms. Tell me something else that you're afraid of. I won't laugh this time. I promise. I put my hand to my mouth to hide my smile. I'm afraid of losing you, Mel. He speaks softly, earnestly. I can see it in his blue eyes, but I can't hold his stare. I look away and focus on his hard chest. I run a fingertip down his sternum, but I look up at him again and our eyes lock. Honestly, Adam, I don't understand why you want to keep me. My voice trembles, and I want to look away but can't. He closes his eyes and flares his nostrils. His cheek twitches. When he opens his eyes again, the way he looks at me almost makes my heart stop. I never could figure out why you don't see yourself the way that I do, but I get it now. I understand. I'm not going to tell you why I want to keep you. I'm going to show you. He runs the back of his knuckles on my cheek. Tell me you'll give me a chance to show you. I'm here, aren't I? Feeling a sudden bout of shyness, I bite my bottom lip and pull the blanket to cover my breasts, but he pulls them down. Don't hide from me. Let me see the parts of you that you don't let anyone else see. But what if you see them and decide I'm not worth it? I whisper. My heart rate speeds up while I wait for him to answer. I hold my breath and bite my bottom lip so hard, I'm afraid it will bleed. The only thing that will happen is that I'll want more and more of you. I want every side of Melanie Flynn. Even the bad. I want to be the one who makes it better. He runs a hand over my messy hair and looks into my eyes. He's nervous. I can tell from his shallow breathing and the twitching of his eye. Why, Adam? Why would you want that? Because you're my wife. Because I've felt a connection to you before I ever laid eyes on your face. When all I knew was your voice. That's why. I can tell he wants to say more, but he doesn't. He holds his breath while he waits for me to speak. Almost overcome with emotions, tears flow freely from my eyes. I move over and climb on top of his naked body. His arms automatically wrap around my waist, and I bury my face on the side of his neck. I would love that, Adam. I'll try, but it will take time. Just be patient with me, okay? Can we not put an expiration date on our marriage? I know I said a year, but... Done. No expiration date. He relaxes underneath me, letting out a loud rush of breath. Unless you want out, I quickly add. Never, he growls. His large hands caress my lower back and I sink deeper onto his body. As hard as it is, he's very comfortable to lay on. Tell me something else that nobody knows, he says. I kiss his neck and roll off him, but I cuddle to his side and sigh when he pulls me close. Before I left New Jersey, I started law school. Nobody knows this. The company I worked for offered tuition reimbursement, and I managed to get into CUNY School of Law. I only got through one semester before I lost my job. I just submitted my application to Northeastern School of Law before I went to Vegas. I bite my lip and hold my breath. I've never told that to anyone before. Wow, Mel. That's amazing. I probably won't get in. It's really competitive, and I don't want to ever work at a law firm, but a law degree can open lots of doors in my field. He leans over and kisses my nose. It's a gesture so small, so tender that something inside of me melts. You'll get in. You'll finish and go on to do great things. I'll be that proud husband at your law school graduation. I'll also be the one bringing you snacks when you study for the bar. A smile so wide spreads across my face. 
I can picture him doing just that. Being my cheerleader, encouraging me when I want to give up, and supporting me through it all. Your turn. Tell me something else no one knows, I tell him. When I was in the second grade, the school arranged something called Donuts with Dad. I begged my mom to make Dad come, and he promised he would. Of course, he called the night before and told her he couldn't. I pretended I was okay, but I spent that entire night crying in my room. I was never quite the same after that. That's how we spent the next few hours. The two of us exchanging secrets that no one else knows about us. It was almost sunrise by the time I fell asleep with his arms wrapped around my naked body. When I wake up hours later, we're still in the same position, only he has thrown a leg across my thighs keeping me securely in place. His phone starts to vibrate on his nightstand, and my bladder is begging to be relieved. Adam, I whisper when I have no luck pushing his leg off. Adam. He finally stirs and lifts his leg. Your phone. I stumble out of the room, uncaring about my naked body. Despite only getting a few hours of sleep, I feel great even though my hair's a mess and I have bags under my eyes, but none of that matters this morning. The smile doesn't leave my face. Even while I brush my teeth. Not even when I jump in the shower to wash the sweat away. When I step out of the shower to find him standing at the sink brushing his teeth, I walk over and plant a kiss on his cheek. He spanks my wet behind while I reach for my towel. Let's go out for breakfast. It's going to snow again later, and I want to cuddle on the sofa. He grabs my wrist, pulls me to him, and kisses my lips. What about your dad? I thought we were meeting him for breakfast. He looks adorable with his messy hair and flushed face. He texted. They left a few hours ago to avoid the storm. Breakfast with my wife sounds perfect. He smiles at me, and I kiss him one more time before I leave the bathroom. Half an hour later, we close our front door and walk down the stairs hand in hand. We were so close to making our exit when the downstairs apartment door opens and my mother steps out. Adam automatically puts an arm across my shoulder, and neither one of us offers a greeting. In fact, I think he growls. I made pancakes, she says, looking from me to Adam. Thanks, but Adam doesn't eat pancakes, I tell her. Well, I can make him whatever he wants, she offers. Before I can tell her no, Adam speaks and says, I appreciate it, but we want to get out and get some air before the snow starts. We'll see you later. He leads me through the front door, when we step outside, we intertwine our hands and walk to a neighborhood breakfast place. If you're not going to sit on her, you have to keep her covered at all times because she's just plain OL ugly. I fold the blanket and drape it across Lola, covering most of her hideousness from sight. Do you know how long it took me to find a blanket this size? He snorts, grabs my wrist, and pulls me onto his lap. Today has been amazing. From our talk last night to breakfast at the diner this morning. It's been magical. We know things about each other that nobody else does, and after that confession he made about his dad, I held his hand and told him that I understood. Maybe he always knew from the beginning that we're kindred spirits who have dealt with rejection from the very people who are supposed to love us unconditionally. Don't talk about Lola like that. You'll hurt her feelings. When he bites the top of my ear, I let out a loud shriek. I reach for my bowl of popcorn, but he yanks me back and grabs the bowl before I can. He tucks me into his side and feeds me popcorn while he searches for a movie. The blinds are open, and even though the sun hasn't set yet, it's gray as light snow starts to fall. We're not getting a storm like we did weeks ago, but half a foot is still a lot. I never cared much for snow, but it's not so bad when you're cuddling with your husband. No. I say for the tenth time since he started scrolling.
No science fiction. Your taste in movies is as bad as your taste in furniture. I don't want to watch any of that girly shit, Mel. And no goofy comedies either. He flips some more, and when I get exasperated, I try and take the remote from him. He lifts his hand straight up into the air and blocks me with his other hand. It's as if it takes no effort to stop me. You want to do trial by combat again, he asks with a smug smile. You only won because you cheated. No, that was you who cheated. And I still won. Something starts to vibrate in his pocket. A look of irritation crosses his face, but he smiles when he sees Ma flashing across the screen. He puts the phone to his ear, stands up, and mouths that he'll be right back. Just as I grab the remote and get comfortable on the couch, the knock on the door interrupts me. In too much of a good mood to be irritated, I run to the door and open it without asking who it is. That was my first mistake. My mother stands on the other side of the threshold holding two large Tupperware bowls. My second mistake was letting her inside the apartment after she asked if she could come in. Since you two didn't want breakfast, I brought you dinner. Instead of handing me the bowls, she walks to the kitchen and puts them down on the table. Thanks, is all I say. I stick my hands in the back pockets of my jeans and wait for her to leave. Where's Adam? He's in the back talking to his mother. I take a few steps out of the kitchen, hoping she'll follow me to the door, but she stays rooted to her spot. You seem to be pretty chummy with his mother. I don't respond but arch my eyebrows. The manicures and matching necklaces. Our family isn't even Catholic. No, but Adam's family is, and she gave me something symbolic to her. Is that a problem for you? I do my best to keep my temper in check, but that's no easy feat. Are you planning on converting? Converting? I'm not religious. Other than going to church with Grandma a few times when we were kids, we never went. And why do you care? Just as I get my hand on the doorknob, she speaks again. Why does every interaction between us have to be a fight? I'm trying, Melanie. I keep my back turned and count to ten. Once I've calmed down, I turn to face her. Trying what exactly? To have a relationship with my daughter. Why? You've never wanted one before. Listen, you have a great relationship with Jason and Alex. Focus on that, and don't worry about me. I'm fine. She takes a step closer to me and I take a sidestep out of the way. I've always wanted one. Listen. She runs a hand through her salt and pepper hair. My mom always swore she would never dye her hair. She spent too much time watching our grandmother use cheap hair dye to bother. I know I've made some mistakes with you, and I was hoping that since I'm here now, we can try to heal. I let out a deep breath and drop my hands to my sides. I look around her, hoping and praying that Adam will come out and save me, but I know his phone calls with his mom never take less than half an hour. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, mother. I'm really not. No part in me wants to be mean to you or to treat you like you've always treated me. But I think it's best if we leave things between us alone. I'm in a great place in my life, and I know you've gotten into some issues recently. Maybe you should focus on fixing your problems and not me. I do my best to keep my voice calm, but just having her here is making my entire body itch. I want to grab the blanket and cover my entire body just so she won't see me and tear me down. There it is. Say it. Let it out, Melanie. Judge me the same way you think I've judged you. The way I think. As if I'm making the entire thing up. I've played a part, but you exaggerate things. You've played a part. Like your constant favoritism. Did you only just play a part in that, mother? 
or the belittling of me. Was that just a part two? Her head rolls back, but she takes a deep breath and says, you never gave me a chance to explain. It's so much better for you to hold this thing between us over my head, isn't it? I wait for the blind rage, but it doesn't come. The only thing I feel is resignation, but because I want this to be the last time we have this conversation, I don't ask her to leave. None of what I just said has anything to do with what I overheard that morning. None of it. But as usual, you refuse to take any responsibility. You want to go back to that morning as if it's the only explanation for the state of our relationship. But if you want to go back there, fine. So, I'm partly to blame because I overheard you telling my aunt that you regret having me, and I've done nothing but cause strife in your life. That's my fault. I didn't say that. I. You did say it. I yell, stunning her. I remember every word you said, so own it. Do you know how many times I've replayed that conversation in my head? Hundreds. What I don't need is you being around here and reminding me of this shit. You're entitled to your feelings about me, just like I'm entitled to mine about you. This time, I open the door and gesture for her to leave. So, that's it. You married Adam and found yourself a new mother. Yes, because my marriage is about you. Of course, it is. That was my diabolical plan all along. I married Adam for his mother. Are you happy now? You figured it out. I gesture for her to leave again, but when she makes no moves to go, I slam the door shut to keep out the draft. I love my children, Melanie. Both of them. I don't doubt that, but you only like one of us. Maybe my actions showed that, but I'd really like to change that. She takes a small step closer to me, slowly closing the distance. Here's the thing. You can't change it. Like I said, I'm not trying to hurt you. I did that for years to you and Jason and that only made me feel worse. And let's be honest. It's been ten years, mother, and you've never once shown any interest in fixing things between us. I don't buy your sudden interest in having a relationship with me. You're not here for me. You've never been there for me because you never wanted me. She looks down, but I don't miss the unshed tears in her eyes. 29. Melly. What about Mermaid? Ananda asks Adam while she shoves a chip in her mouth. I'm picturing a Halloween costume, and I hope it's slutty. Is it slutty, Mel? Maybe you can get a long, blue wig to go with it. And your torso's gotta be exposed. Everyone erupts in laughter. Even Molly, but she walks over and gently whacks him in the back of the head. A line? I ask. Modified A line? Molly says. What about sheath? Ananda throws in. No idea what any of that means, but if it. If you say slutty one more time, I'm gonna whack you in the mouth. Molly makes a fist to prove her point. Adam closes his mouth and pretends to zip his lips. Leave Adam alone. Alex waddles over and puts a hand on his arm. He is way too manly to know about dress styles. Just know that Melly is going to look gorgeous. Alex is right. I'm too much man for this conversation. Look at this. He shows us his bicep and all the women pretend to swoon. All the women except Molly who only rolls her eyes at her son. Wedding dress and bridesmaid dresses are done. I still need to coordinate with Mel's mom about our colors, but I think we should match the bridesmaid dresses. Maybe a darker shade of blue. Too bad she was sick and couldn't come with us. Molly wrings her hands. All laughter and humor cease. Alex looks down and lays a hand on her lower back. I walk over to her and help her to Lola. 
All week there was talk about whether I was going to invite my mother with us. All week I thought about it. Hell, I had a couple of sleepless nights over it. Jason hinted several times about asking her, but my need to have a stress-free day without any tinge of judgment or disapproval won out in the end, and my mother was left out. Besides, the last conversation with her left me completely drained. But today didn't go as planned. My heart felt heavy despite having the best group of women with me. And as much fun as we had, the feeling of guilt lingered. Almost as if Ananda can sense my change of mood, she comes over and rests her chin on my shoulder while Adam intertwines my fingers with his. I'll ask her about that when she's feeling better, Molly, I say quickly. We have flowers on Wednesday, but Alex, we'll FaceTime you. Jason only let you go today because you wouldn't be on your feet. Let me. Alex snorts. Oh, please. Your brother can take several seats. Ananda walks over and gives her a high five. But I agree to do flowers remotely. This baby is wreaking havoc on my back. Are you coming with us? Ananda asks Adam. Do you need me there, Mel? I can tell from his tone that he'd rather be anywhere else. I'll call you if I do. At this point, I'll just tell you when and where to show up. I can't even trust you to pick out your own tux. Thanks, love. He smiles at me without an ounce of shame. I'll give you my measurements. Oh, wow. You're terrible, Adam, Alex chuckles. It's fine. Don't complain if you don't like something, I warn him. He'd better not complain, Molly says making a fist at Adam. As long as you're there and you say I do, it will be perfect. The women swoon at his words, and a smile spreads across my face. The food we ordered arrives, and when Adam goes downstairs to get it, I text Jason and tell him to come upstairs with Addie. He shows up a few minutes later, and Addison goes directly to her mother. She sits on her lap and lays her head on Alex's boobs while Jason gets food for them. A salad, love? Adam asks over his grilled chicken a few minutes later. I have a wedding dress to fit, but as soon as we land in Paris, I'm going to eat no less than six croissants per day. We'll need to buy two seats for me for the trip back home. He wiggles his eyebrows and offers me some of his food. And, I say, lowering my voice, I have to update the wedding spreadsheet later. I've run into some unexpected expenses. Later, he whispers back. Jason takes a seat next to me. He smiles, but the smile doesn't quite reach his eyes. On closer inspection, he looks tired. More so than usual. Adam, Molly says, at some point, you're going to have to take your uncle shopping. Not just for the wedding, but all his shirts are too tight. And you know he won't order clothes online. Adam sighs, but he kisses me on the cheek before he joins his mother on the couch. You okay, Jace? I ask my brother. He takes a bite of his taco and smiles, but the smile never fully forms. He drops the taco, exhales, and meets my eyes. Mom's upset. My stomach drops, not just at his words but at the accusatory tone. So, I don't say a word. I hold his stare and wait for him to either say more or to shut up. Melly, did you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. I turn back to my salad and stuff lettuce in my mouth. It gets stuck in my throat and I nearly finish my water to get it down. That's it. What do you want me to say? I don't want her to be upset, believe it or not, I tell him. You have a funny way of showing it. I drop my fork in my plate and look around the room for Adam. He must sense my distress. He gets up while in mid-conversation with his mother. You okay, Mel? He sits next to me and starts to rub the back of my neck. 
I'm having a conversation with my sister, Flynn. You don't need to be involved in this. I flinch at not just my brother's words, but his dismissive tone. Don't dismiss my husband, I hiss at him. I would never do that to your wife, so show us the same respect. Oh, really? Because a few weeks ago you came home from Vegas married after a drunken night. I stand up so fast, my chair topples over. Adam stands right along with me and takes a step to Jason. I quickly stand between them. I'm talking to my sister about our mother and about the fact that she was excluded today. Maybe you had something to do with that. I turn to face my brother, stunned by his accusation. Are you serious right now, Jason? You think Adam cares who goes with me to buy dresses? It was my decision, so stand down. I look around the room. Molly and Ananda are doing their best to make it look like they're not paying attention, but Alex is glaring at her husband. We need to talk. Jason takes my hand and pulls me down the hall and into Adam's home gym. Adam shuts the door behind us. You could have just taken her with you, Jason says, sighing and running a hand over his head. She didn't want to, Adam says before I can respond. I told you to stay out of it, Jason growls. How does it look that you took Flynn's mother and not your own? Jason asks me. I'm not going to stay out of it, Dupree, Adam says. Don't you come up here and try to bully my wife with a guilt trip. Bully? I should have kicked your ass out of here last year when I had the chance, you sneaky fuck. Oh my god, will you stop? Jason, I thought you of all people would understand that I wanted today to be a peaceful and happy experience. I'm not going out of my way to hurt our mother. But you did, and I was left downstairs trying to clean up the mess you left behind. You didn't see. You need to shut the hell up right now, Dupree, Adam warns. But if this is how it's always been between the three of you, I can see why Mel keeps her distance from that woman downstairs. That woman is our mother, so show some damn respect. On second thought, just shut the hell up and mind your own damn business. Adam takes a step to Jason. I step between them and put a hand to Adam's chest. My wife is my business. Which part of that don't you get, Dr. Genius? And I know she upsets my wife every single time they see each other. And now I know you always side with mommy, Adam taunts. Enough. I yell, turning to Jason. Don't you say another rude word to Adam. Just stop. And for the record, you left for college, and I was left with her for four years, dealing with her disappointment and criticism every time I fell short of measuring up to her perfect son. Everything I did was met with Jason did it better. It was always Jason, Jason, Jason. You are her perfect child, and you have no idea what it's like for me. You're not going to come up here and make me feel bad because I chose my peace of mind. Jason stands there, hands on his hips while he takes shallow breaths. I reach for Adam and let him wrap me in his strong arms. I bury my face in his chest and breathe him in, each breath bringing me closer and closer to peace. Adam rubs my back and murmurs soothing words, and the entire time, I can feel him scowling at Jason, who now remains quiet. The door bursts open and Alex waddles in. Jason Dupree, I warned you. Let's go home. Addison needs a fresh diaper. She grabs Jason's hand. Adam and I follow them out and watch as they pack up the rest of their food, say a quick goodbye, and leave. Ananda soon follows, mouthing sorry to me while she runs out the door, leaving us alone with Molly. That looked tense. Molly pulls me from Adam and takes me in her arms. I don't know how I didn't pick up on it before. Your mom's not sick, darling. I shake my head at her confirming her theory. It's a complicated relationship, I tell her. 
my mother and I wrote the book on that. I've only scratched the surface with what I told you, so I understand. The thing you must remember, darling, is that it's your relationship and you have to navigate it however is best for you. Whatever you're comfortable with, but please make sure you don't do anything you'll regret when she's gone. She hugs both of us before leaving. When it's just me and Adam, he cradles my face and searches my eyes. He only relaxes when I smile at him. Wanting his comfort, I wrap my arms around him and stick my face in the middle of his chest. He lifts me off the ground and takes me to Lola. Once I'm comfortable on his lap, I soak up his warmth. I'm sorry Jason treats you that way. He only does it because of the things I said in the beginning. That's on me. I'll fix it. Mel, I don't care about how Jason treats me. As long as you don't treat me like that. Never. A sudden wave of emotion hits. I let out a choked sob and hide my face in the crook of Adam's neck and sob. His hands pause on my back, and I sense the confusion rolling off him. I'm sorry, love. I can go downstairs and beat your brother's face in. Just say the word. This isn't about Jason. An involuntary sob catches me off guard and more tears fall. I pull myself together enough to look into his eyes. His brows are furrowed, and I think he's stopped breathing. No, Mel. Don't you tell me you've changed your mind about us. You promised. Shoo, I put a finger to his lips. I haven't. His relief is immediate. He lets out a rushed breath and it caresses my cheek. And I won't. I take a deep breath while I ponder my next words. But I'm so afraid, Adam. I'm so afraid that you'll be the one who changes your mind about us. Unable to take the look in his eyes, I lower my gaze and focus on his chest. Mel, how can you believe that after I've chased you for two years? I'm exactly where I want to be. His words are reassuring, but my heart won't stop thumping. I like this. I like what we have, and I don't want to lose that. I've always felt less than. Not good enough. It's hard when your own mother treats you as if you're unimportant. I've always been so afraid that when people get to know me, they'll see what she sees, but I don't want to be that scared person anymore. I'm all in, Adam. I'm going to rock this marriage thing. He leans down and graces me with soft kisses. He presses his forehead on mine, and when he closes his eyes, his eyelashes tickle my forehead, and I giggle at the sensation. Promise me you'll never take it back, Adam says. Promise me that you'll honor our vows. That we're in this until death do us part. I open my eyes, look deep into his blue orbs and say, didn't you hear me? I'm going to grab marriage by the balls. I don't know what that means, but it sounds kind of painful, love, he says with a laugh. It means I'm going to be the world's best wife. So, I promise. Maybe this thing we have, this obsession, deep down I've always recognized your feelings about not being good enough. Your issues with your mom and mine with my father. He never bothered with me, and it hurt. It still hurts, Mel. Even now as an adult, I still struggle with it. In my head, I know it's not my fault, and that he was a selfish man, but my heart is another story. We share the same pain, love. We do. And your father missed out, Adam. It was his loss, and now he's gone and will never know the amazing son he created. He rests his forehead on mine. Thank you for saying that. You don't know how much that helps. Molly raised a great man. His soft lips land on my forehead. I'm sorry about before. Sho. Sure. I don't care about before. I only care about now and tomorrow. Tomorrow looks bright, he tells me. 
Let me say this, please. When he nods, I continue. I'm sorry for leaving you in Vegas and for freaking out those first few days when we got back. You didn't deserve that, and I was a scared fool. And yes, tomorrow does look bright even though we might be living in a cardboard box because this wedding is so expensive, I sigh. Ooh, I feel another spreadsheet in our near future. I hop off his lap, and he slaps my ass. I let out a yelp and run to the bedroom for my laptop. When I return, I pull out several receipts from my purse and update the document. So, apparently, seven months is not a long time to plan a wedding, and we're paying extra to have things expedited. Do you know it can take up to nine to twelve months to get a wedding dress? He does a fake gasp and puts both hands to his cheeks and says, Really? The wedding industry is shameful. I playfully slap him upside his head the same way his mother does. So, I had to pay extra to get my dress in time for alterations if needed. I hope the flowers won't cost too much, and Love, don't worry about it. Just use the credit card. Don't stress out about the cost. 30. Adam She wasn't kidding about being all in. That's everything I want to hear and my worst nightmare rolled into one, but I clear my throat and put a smile on my face and hope she can't smell my fear. We can merge checking accounts. I can transfer to yours or you to mine. I've never been so happy to have accounts at two different banks before then I am right at this moment. She smiles at my suggestion and nods. Okay. We can figure that out later but we need to figure out how we're going to budget these added expenses. We can't have any late credit card payments. She talks some more, and I do my best to pay attention while I move money around on my banking app. She asks me how much I make, and I tell her without meeting her eyes. Okay. She smiles, showing off all her teeth. That makes us equal. She claps her hands together as if she just discovered some great secret. I closed the banking app and put my phone away. I thought you said you made more than me. I do, but we're in the same bracket. I look at her and raise my eyebrows. She tells me her salary and says, you know the box you check for your salary range? We're in the same box. So, yes, I do make more, but we're in the same income bracket, which makes us equals. She reaches over and runs her fingers through my hair and kisses my cheek. And that's important to you? Very. I want to be on equal footing. I know things can happen, but I want us to at least start at the same level. I sigh and lean back in my chair. I don't see why that matters. It wouldn't bother me if you made twice as much as me. She looks at me and smiles while she shakes her head as if I just missed the point. It's different for me, she says. Jason makes about nine times as much as Alex. I'd hate that. You don't think they're equal, Mill? You're right. They're not. She runs the man, I chuckle. If anyone is beneath anyone, it's him. And, I tell her, grabbing her chin, unless you're getting another husband, you don't have to worry about that. I'd never treat you that way. She looks down, and I wait for her to speak again. I know she's considering her next words. You don't understand. It's about me, not anyone else. I was always the unimportant one growing up, and I don't want to be that person anymore. I want to be capable. I want to be a true partner to you, and that means contributing financially. It's important to me. If we're going to build an empire, we're going to do it together. So, if you found out I was a secret millionaire, you'd bolt? I do my best to sound playful, but my heart is beating so fast, I'm worried she'll hear it. Oh, really? She gives me the most exaggerated eye roll. How many millions are we talking about? Fifty, give or take. I give her a noncommittal shrug. She throws her head back and her laughter fills the kitchen. She's unguarded and beautiful, and I can't help but reach over, pick her up, 
and put her on my lap. It's freaky how strong you are, but I'd be worried if you had $50 million and chose to rent this place from my brother. And you lived like a broke frat boy before I came up here and rescued you. Mm, I nibbled the side of her neck. She leans away, giving me better access. I brush her hair aside and bite her skin. I suck right at the base of her neck, uncaring about leaving any marks. Think about it, Mel. No more spreadsheets. No more stress about what we spend for the wedding or what house we can afford. You can quit your job and go to law school full time. I leave wet kisses on her neck, but my wife has stopped reacting to me. I pull my lips away and she slowly turns to face me. I like it this way better with both of us contributing. It's moot, stud. You probably don't even have $50 in your wallet right now, never mind $50 million. I reach into my back pocket, pull out, and open my wallet. She looks in it, only to give me a smug smile when I pull out two $5 bills. Damn. I guess you're right, love. Then she straddles me and kisses me deep. She starts to grind and pull my shirt over my head, and I break the kiss long enough for her to take the shirt off. All that talk about equality has made me horny, she whispers against my mouth. I stand, and she wraps her legs around me. I'm going to give you 50 million orgasms. Oh, my poor, broke, and delusional husband. I'll settle for two. The instant we get in the bedroom, and I slam the door shut with my foot, I toss her on the bed, and dive on top of her. She screams and laughs at the same time until I silence her with my mouth. 